All right, I think we're going to get started. Hello and welcome. I'm Dominique Alex. I'm the Chief Program Officer here at Mary's Place. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to begin our time today by acknowledging the land on which we um, operate as the traditional home of the Coast Salish peoples. We offer with gratitude to elders and all other Coast Salish peoples, past, present, and future, who have made it possible for us to live, work, and play in this community, and invite each of us to build authentic relationships with Indigenous communities, continuing to learn about the past and present colonial impacts, and to move beyond an acknowledgement to action. Thank you. We're excited for today's webinar, but for those of you that don't know a lot about Mary's Place, I'd like to share a little bit of our history and the work that we are up to today. So we began about 20 years ago um, as a day center right here in the heart of downtown Seattle, um, working with women who are experiencing homelessness in a drop-in um, day center, which is still the heart and soul of Mary's Place today. Um, and we are serving about 100 um, women a day. Um, we opened our first overnight shelter for women and children back in 2011 and have continued to develop that programming to address the growing need um, in our community. And now today we are serving um, families and children um, with over 720 beds a night across five 24-7 shelters in the King County area. But what we know is that the need is so great that it's just not enough. And so today we are seeing unprecedented numbers of calls through our emergency intake line. Um, every day we're getting about 30 to 35 um, calls. Um, that's families that are on our wait list and we are only able to take in between one and three families a day. And so that gut wrenching feeling of not being able to take everyone who's sleeping outside, we know there's more work to do. So for those who can't come into our shelters, our mobile outreach team is meeting families where they are, and that may be in their cars or their tents, and they're able to connect them with resources and provide flexible funding to address the barriers and help them move into homes quickly. But we know that the safest and best place for our families is to stay in their hard-won homes. So we are working to prevent families from falling into homelessness in the first place to help prevent trauma, um, particularly amongst our children in our community, and to end what can be what we know of as generational homelessness. So we invite you all to look at our past Lunch and Learn webinars. Um, we've had many topics and things like housing services, um, our youth services, the impacts of systemic racism on homelessness, and so many others. Katrina is going to drop a link into the chat so you all can check that out. Um, but today at our Lunch and Learn, we're going to do something a little different, and I'm really excited about this opportunity today, and I hope you will be too. Uh, we usually have a panel of speakers, um, some of which are from Mary's Place um, and also with some of our community partners, um, but today we're going to talk about an issue we're seeing um, um, with a unique approach um, and a special guest that we're going to spend the time to better understand the work he is doing with his colleagues and a book that he has also written to understand what really drives the prevalence of homelessness in cities and in particular, King County. I'd like to introduce University of Washington Assistant Professor of Real Estate and the co-author of Homelessness is a Housing Problem, Greg Colburn. Welcome, Greg. I'm going to turn it to you to maybe share a little bit about yourself before we get started. Hi, Dominique. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, hello, all. Thanks for taking time out of your uh, your busy days. Um, I am, as Dominique mentioned, uh, faculty at the at the UW. Um, my family and I moved here in 2017 to begin my work. And as someone who studies housing and homelessness, I got involved in a lot of community conversations on this topic. Um, I'm also an odd academic and I always joke like that's probably not sufficiently descriptive because a lot of academics are, are fairly odd, but um, my first career is in finance. I was an investment banker and private equity investor. And so I bring uh, a, a previous career in, in finance and the markets to my work. And so I do think about housing markets a lot and how housing markets impact 
uh, vulnerable households. And, and so if you've, if you read the book or have heard me talk before, you'll know that that is uh, a key part of, of the message that I, that I, uh, that I deliver. So I'm looking forward to the conversation, Dominique. All right. Well, before we begin, if you have any questions you'd like to send in advance or at any point along the way, um, you can enter those into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. So we'll leave some time for that. We're excited that so many of you have joined us today. So if you're unable to get to your questions, we'll be sure to follow up with you um, after the webinar. So this is a fascinating book. Uh, Greg, that does a great job of ruling out so many stereotypes and stories that we are here um, about the causes of homelessness. And so spoiler alert, it's about housing market conditions. So my first question for you is, can you talk a little bit about what it is not about? And I know you looked at several cities in the United States, anything you have specifically about here in King County? Well, um, you know, the purpose of the book was to explain to us to answer a pretty simple question, which is why is homelessness so bad in some places and not others? So, for example, Seattle King County is five times Chicago Cook County. That's a huge, huge variation. So the idea of the book was if we can answer that question, it should tell us something fundamental about the nature of this phenomenon. And that's why we wanted to write the book. Obviously, in doing so, we need to talk about causation and what's causing homelessness. And why that gets to be difficult and why there are a lot of different perceptions around the causes of homelessness is that there are individual level causes or risk factors and there are community level risk factors and causes. I, I, what we argue in the book is that the cost of housing and the availability of housing at the community level is what drives homelessness, which is why Seattle has five times the homelessness of Chicago. This doesn't mean that addiction and mental illness aren't factors. If you as an individual are addicted, mentally ill, poor, et cetera, you're more likely to experience homelessness. We know that. So we're not suggesting that those aren't causal factors. They are at the individual level. But the reason Seattle has five times the homelessness of Chicago is not because we have more people who are addicted, not more people who are mentally ill, not more people who are poor. It's the fact that the conditions in which those um, factors occur, Matt, are, 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 are very difficult. Meaning being poor in a rich city, to put it very bluntly, being poor in a rich city is much worse than being poor in a, in a, in a more um, affordable city, which is why Detroit has far less homelessness than Seattle does. They have lots more poverty, way more. It's the most impoverished city in the United States, far less homelessness than we have in Seattle. And so being poor, mentally ill, addicted, um, have, if you've been discriminated against because of your race, ethnicity, all those factors in Seattle are, uh, are really challenging because accessing housing is so difficult. So that's kind of the overall gist of, of the story. And, and Seattle fits very neatly into this narrative because everything we argue is, is, is abundantly evident here in, in our own backyard, unfortunately, for those who are trying to access housing. Yeah, thank you for that. And we are seeing that crisis exacerbating. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sentence in your book, um, for those most likely to experience homelessness, is not so much a symptom of poverty as a symptom of affluence? Yeah, what we highlight in the book is um, homelessness in the United States has changed over the last 100 years. And so when you, when you go back through the literature on homelessness, the first time we really see people talking about this in, in um, significant numbers is during the Great Depression, so the 1930s in the United States. And at that time, um, these really encampments, we would now call them encampments, popped up in cities all over the United States. And they called them Hoovervilles after Herbert Hoover, who was president at the time. It was kind of a derisive term about the economic policies of that president. And so while tragic, there was some intuition behind that, which is they had 25% unemployment at the time. There was people were losing their homes. And so the fact that we'd have homelessness in a time of economic dislocation made perfect sense. What's interesting about the modern manifestation of homelessness is where we see the most homelessness in the United States is in the most affluent places around. Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, the three most affluent cities in the United States have three of the highest homeless populations in the United States. So homelessness thrives amidst affluence because of the impact it has on housing costs. It doesn't thrive amidst poverty, even though we know if you're poor, you're more likely to experience homelessness, which is one of the head scratchers, which is why people read it and kind of tilt their head a little bit and say, well, I thought poverty causes homelessness. It does. It does. But at a city level, homelessness thrives amidst affluence, which is why we see homelessness 
next to Wall Street and next to Silicon Valley and next to Amazon in these very, very booming affluent cities um, uh, on our coast. That's very interesting. I. Um thinking about root causes, right? Because I think a lot of times we do see those symptoms that, you know, you walk, you're walking down the street and um, we have those connections, right? So you um, use an analogy of musical chairs to highlight the difference between risk factors and root causes of homelessness. Um, can you share that analogy and expand on some of those factors and vulnerabilities? Sure. Um, and it's 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 funny. My author and I kind of debated whether we should include this this analogy or metaphor in the book. And um, ultimately, I'm really glad we decided to do so because I get more comments on this than anything else in the book, which is interesting that people have a little bit of a light bulb moment with this. But um, so we use the term precipitating event in the book, but it also could use the term risk factor. It's the same idea, which is um, when you when you ask people about um, why they're experiencing homelessness, many times they'll talk about precipitating events. For example, my husband beat me up, my boyfriend beat me up, and I ran, right? And so now I'm in a domestic violence shelter where I'm experiencing homelessness. I got divorced. I, I had a fight with my roommate and they kicked me out, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's not that we don't honor those explanations. We, of course, do. All of those are very legitimate explanations for why someone is going to experience homelessness. But the point is that um, the context in which those things occur really, really matter. So to draw the distinction between a root cause and a risk factor or a precipitating event, think of musical chairs, 10 friends, 10 chairs. Um, the leader starts the music, everyone walks around in a circle, the leader pulls one chair out, we now have 10 people in nine chairs. When the music stops, everyone scrambles for a chair and by definition, someone loses. That's the nature of the game. And in this case, Mike loses because he was on crutches. He'd hurt his ankle and he's hobbling around. And and so at the end of the day, the music stops, everyone sits, and Mike is left standing. If we interviewed Mike and said, why do you think you lost the game? He'd say, I had a bad ankle. It was his precipitating event or his risk factor. And everyone would say, well, yeah, Mike lost because he had a bad ankle. But if we take a step back and really understand why do we think that Mike didn't have a chair, it's because we didn't have enough chairs. And had we had 10 chairs, Mike would have hobbled over, found a seat, and been seated. But when we have forced scarcity, the people who lose the game are the people who are slow. They were in a bad position. They hurt their ankle, whatever the case may be. And that's exactly what's happening on the streets of Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York and Boston and DC right now, which is when housing is scarce, the people who are going to lose the game, the vicious fight for housing are people who are vulnerable in some way, shape or form. If you're physically disabled, if you are old, if you're poor, if you've been discriminated against, whatever the case may be, and now we see you on the street. And people say, well, of course, Joe's doesn't have a house. He's addicted. As, and we're not thinking about this vicious game of musical chairs that we're playing in Seattle for housing right now. And the fact that Joe lost uh, because he is fighting an addiction um, is masking the true cause, which is an insufficient supply of housing. There are people who use drugs and alcohol. There are people who are mentally ill in every state and every city in the nation. And in some places that manifests itself as a massive homelessness crisis, in other places it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't in other places is because they have sufficient housing. Yeah, very interesting. I was just thinking about the tip of the iceberg, right? We, we exactly. only see that little small part of it and what's underneath the surface and those root causes that you speak to um, around the availability of housing. Really interesting, the, the resources. Um, well, many and, feel, and the women, oh, women and children that you serve, I mean, I always say this all the time, you might not be seeing them on the street, um, but they are a big percentage of the population of people experiencing homelessness. We, we focus on the people that we observe on Third Avenue and we ignore all the other people who are in this broad system. And that then shapes our understanding of a crisis in a way that's counterproductive. Right. And with families, because that's who Mary's Place is really serving, um, we know that our families often are invisible. They are not in the visible eye of folks. And so um, the story of homelessness is not as visible and holistic um, because they are afraid of losing their children. So trying to keep them safe and survive and um, they're still part of that story. And so it's really interesting to make sure we highlight that. So thank you. So my next question for you is that many feel overwhelmed by the community's crisis of homelessness and that no response can mitigate it. Can you share some of the solutions your research research has provided? 
Yeah, I would say one of my personal, there are a lot of frustrations if you work in the field of homelessness, if you study homelessness. And so many people on this call, if you've been engaged, I'm sure you've you've dealt with these. But from, from my standpoint, one of my great frustrations is, and I was actually just looking at CNN before I got on here, and it said, California has spent, spent $17 billion on homelessness and the problem got worse. And it um, that headline, which I've heard that from people over and over and over and over and over, um, really frustrates me. And, and what's frustrating to me is we know that the interventions um, that are well-documented, that have been well-researched work. The problem is, is that as a nation and as many communities that, that deal with a lot of homelessness, um, we have not scaled them to uh, the scale of the problem. And therefore, if, if, if you've got a $10 billion problem and you spend $1 billion uh, and then we complain about the billion dollars not working, the point is, well, it did work. It did work. What we needed was 10 times that effort. And, and that's what we're dealing with right now. And unfortunately, housing is expensive. And therefore, large-scale investments in housing will not, be, uh, will not be cheap. And to date, we've not been willing to do that. And as a result, we, we take half measures. And some of these half measures are still really good. The, 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 the housing levy in Seattle, the, the significant homelessness investments that LA have, have made, have been really, really successful. The problem is the, the, the scale of the problem is much bigger than those interventions. I was on a panel with a woman who runs LASA, which is the homelessness response system in LA. And she said, people always say, they read the LA Times and say, homelessness got a lot worse in LA, which it did, but it masked the fact that they got 25,000 people out of homelessness last year. At the same time, 32 or whatever the number was flowed into homelessness. And so on a net basis, 7,000 more people were homeless in LA County than they were the year before. It doesn't mean that these things don't work. It means had we not done those, that number would be way higher than it is right now. But you see the steady tick upwards and it erodes public confidence in the ability of these things or, or to support the interventions that we know work. Yeah. And so what, we, what I think um, we really need to be thinking about is communicating these investments in a different way and demonstrating their efficacy because that will then, I think, garner greater public support for further investment, as opposed to unfortunately what's happening now, which is a retrenchment or people stepping back from that saying, I don't think it's working. I walked down Third Avenue, it's not working. Why would we continue to invest? And that's, in my opinion, the wrong, the wrong uh, conclusion. To me, the best argument about this, and people say, Greg, I'm not sure housing will fix this. Why do you think it'll fix Joe, who's on the street? Joe's a mess. I hear this all the time. And I'll say, well, we know because we've done it. We cut veteran homelessness in the United States by 50% in 10 years, which is a massive achievement. And how do we do that? We gave people housing. In some cases, it was a voucher. In some cases, it was a unit. In some cases, it was a unit plus supportive services to deal with their PTSD or mental illness, whatever the case may be. And why did we do it? Because it was good politics. It's good politics to take care of veterans. Republicans and Democrats came together and said, we are going to devote the resources needed to do this. And we cut it by 50%. I would say that that narrative is underreported and underappreciated as a, as a huge success. And it demonstrates that the interventions that are happening at the local level actually work. When you can get people into housing, good things happen. And what we're doing by not housing people is we're creating a behavioral health crisis on our streets. And that's what we're observing in Seattle right now. I say to people, if you leave me unsheltered for a year, I'm certainly going to medicate. And it's not going to be the red wine, which I drink now on Friday nights. And I'm probably going to have a behavioral health disorder because I'm going to, it's incredibly traumatic. People are exposed to physical, sexual assault. Oh, it's terrible to be on the streets. So the fact that someone left on the street for a year now has an addiction or a mental illness issue shouldn't surprise anyone. Shouldn't surprise anyone. And so when we don't scale the interventions to the level that we need, um, the, the outcome is tragic, but, but fully expected, fully expected. And that's unfortunately where we are right now. And and that's tough. And so, and I, I, I don't want to minimize how hard it is for elected leaders, because this is a really, this is a problem decades and generations in the making. And now people say, okay, you're mayor for four years, fix this. Well, <laughs> and that's hard to do. And so uh, it's not, the answer is easy, um, but doing it is very, very difficult, which is why we're, we're, we're which is why we are where we are, unfortunately. Yeah. I, earlier, you, you were talking about uh, communicating differently, like the good that's happened in the community. Um, people are getting housed. Um, there is these projects or initiatives that happen. 
Um, can you elaborate maybe a, a one or two things that you think about what does it mean to really communicate differently when it comes to things that are happening with good? Who should we be telling that to? Yeah, I think um, I've spent a lot of time with journalists on this topic um, and trying to get them to change the way that they report on homelessness a little bit, or at least tell what I view to be, you know, my side of the story a little bit. So if you're going to report that homelessness went up by X thousand in Seattle King County, let's have a little more nuance around that, which is why did it go up? It's not going up because interventions don't work. It's going up because people are falling into homelessness at, at incredibly fast rates. And, and if housing continues to be unaffordable and you lose your job, there is no safety net and now people are experiencing homelessness. That's not an indictment of the crisis response system. That is an indictment of the economic and housing system in which we have, in which we live in Seattle. And that's it. Those are, is that a problem? Absolutely, it's a problem and that deserves our time and attention, but that should not then be an indictment of the crisis response system. I think the other thing that's really important is um, communicating when we spend money on a crisis response system, which I believe we have an obligation to do, it's life-saving. We also, let's be clear, we're not intervening upstream. Those are not investments to end homelessness. They are to deal with a crisis that is, um, that we're dealing with right now. And if we wanna intervene upstream and prevent people from falling into that system, we need to create housing options for people. And that's not what shelters are meant to do. Yeah. And that's okay, that doesn't mean shelters are bad. Let's just be clear about what, where we're spending our money. And so when we spend X billion dollars in Washington or California on a crisis response system, well, yes, it's not getting homelessness because it wasn't designed to, it was, it was designed to help people in, in, in a moment of incredible need. Right. And I'm glad we do that. And I'm glad we do that. But it's but let's not confuse what that is for for you know a prevention in some way. Yeah. Well, so I have a good segue question here and thinking hey. about prevention. Um, some of our work recently has been trying to scale up our prevention work. Um, and that's trying to keep families in their hard won homes. Um, can you share some of your findings on the financial costs of homelessness and the effectiveness of prevention and stability solutions? Yeah, so pre um, prevention has been a really interesting area of debate in the academic community over the last probably 25 years. And um, I'm one who would much rather spend money on prevention than a crisis response system. The reason we haven't as a nation invested fully in prevention is because it's been really hard to guess who is going to experience homelessness. What we have is we have a very large population in the United States of people who are at high risk for experiencing homelessness. Yet, fortunately, a relatively small number of those people actually do fall into homelessness. And researchers have not been very good or been successful at identifying who those people are. It's been kind of a needle in a haystack exercise. And so if you wanna provide prevention services, you end up providing it through a very wide swath of people and only a relatively small number of those people actually ultimately needed those services. And so as a nation and as a scholarly community in the 90s, 2000s, there was a shift away from prevention saying, let's wait until we, those people in essence, identify themselves as experiencing homelessness and then we'll provide services to them once they go into the system. The problem with that logic is it is very costly for the individual, for kids, once you get into that system, it has huge negative effects on life outcomes, but it is more cost effective, which is you know this this difficult tension that we have. And so, um, targeting improved targeting would be super helpful because then we could devote and 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 push our resources to people who are going to need it ahead of time. Because once people um, once people go into the system, they're it's very very expensive which is why prevention ideally would be, would be better because paying someone's rent for the next year is way cheaper than paying for them in the, in the crisis response system, whether that's in the emergency room on the streets, streets and sanitation, shelter, whatever the case may be. All these things are terribly costly. And, and when people say, well, Greg, these interventions are expensive. I was like, yeah, they are. You know what else is expensive? Untreated homelessness. And we're, and we're paying for that right now. It's just distributed through all these different systems and therefore we don't necessarily see it on one line item. And so prevention is, is, is absolutely essential, um, and which is why this, you know, at the door, when people come into the crisis response system, if there are resources there to help them maintain their housing, that is far and away, in my opinion, the absolute best intervention, which is, hey, if we pay your rent for the next six months, can you stay there? And if so, yes, let's do that, because that will keep someone in their home, as you said, and, and keep them out of the system, which is, is really valuable. 
Absolutely. And we're also finding that it is way more cost effective and also just highlighting that the trauma on children um, is way less when you can keep someone in their home. So Absolutely. thank you for highlighting that. Um, my next question is in the book, you say much of the money spent on homelessness is in response to the crisis rather than the alternative to it. Can you say more about that? Yeah, and this is, I touched on this in the previous answer a little bit in the sense that a lot of our money is the crisis response system. It's it's not an alternative to, and so when you start to think about other uh, investments, capital investments in affordable housing, that would be an alternative to the crisis response system. We're never going to not have a crisis response system. I, 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 I would love that to be the case. I don't see that anytime soon. Um, but I do think it's important for us to start thinking about strategically where do we want to place those investments. And not all of our investments should be in the crisis response system. I think there should be investments upstream, which is this is an alternative to homelessness, which is creating affordable housing. It is creating supportive housing for people who need it, um, creating other housing options for people, whether it's SROs, hotels, whatever the case may be. Um, that can provide permanent residence for people. Um, that's an alternative to entering um, the homelessness system and the shelter system and, and uh, the associated programs there. Um, and so that's really the, the, the question. And for, for West Coast communities that have more limited shelter capacity, New York, 96% of their uh, people experiencing homelessness are in the shelter system. A relatively small number are unsheltered. Um, that shelter system consumes billions and billions and billions of dollars every year and has for the last 25 or 30 years in New York City. The question for the West Coast then is, as we think about our response, do we scale up that crisis response and increase our shelter capacity, or do we maintain our shelter capacity and also think about other permanent support um, sources of, of housing, which would be that alternative that we talk about in the book. And yeah. because we don't have unlimited resources, these are resource allocation questions that are difficult. and they're well-intended people arguing on both sides there, but that's that's what we're wrestling with right now as a community. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, my last question for you is, who is doing a good job of addressing the housing crisis? And are there lessons there for Seattle and King County? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer this in a couple of ways. Many times the question I get is who's doing a good job with homelessness? And you mentioned housing crisis, which is a slightly different angle. So I'm gonna answer the homelessness one first and then go to your question, Dominique, which is the housing crisis. So um, there are some shining examples in the United States of communities that have done a really good job on homelessness. Milwaukee has done a very good job. Houston's done a very good job and they've received a lot of national press around that. And what they've done is they used the housing first intervention and scaled that within their communities and reduced homelessness pretty significantly. And so the New York Times did a great piece last summer about Houston. And when that was published, people called me in or sent me an email and said, why aren't we doing this in Seattle, Greg? And the point is, is we are. We are using Housing First. Um, but it is easier to scale Housing First in a community with $800 rents and 10% vacancies than it is in Seattle, King County, which is why Houston and Milwaukee were able to use the, their inherent advantage, which is cheaper housing and high vacancies, to get people in using Housing First with money from the Obama administration. And um, that, that we don't have that luxury. Even if we got um, you know, a dump truck full of money here from the federal government and said, we want you to scale housing first, there literally are not units in which to place people. And so our housing scarcity, which increases the likelihood of experiencing homelessness in Seattle, also makes it harder for us to respond because there aren't just units sitting around for us to, to put people in. So the communities that have had more success with homelessness tend to have slightly different market conditions than, than we have here. Your question, which was what places are doing a good job with the housing crisis, which is meaning lack of housing, lack of affordable housing, I don't have a great answer for you. The places with the most acute housing crises in the United States, which have tended to be on our coasts, are struggling, are struggling. They, they are sources of economic prosperity, they are destinations where a lot of people want to live and work. And this ongoing um, pressure of increased population, increased wealth, and lack of housing production continues to exacerbate this crisis. And so none of these communities are frankly doing a very good job. San Francisco is the worst, to be very clear. Seattle has done a better job than San Francisco. We have built more housing, relatively speaking, than San Francisco has. And as a result, our tech boom has 
produce terrible results, but it's not as bad as San Francisco. Unfortunately, what we're also seeing is Sunbelt cities, which have done a pretty good job of accommodating their growth, are starting to fall behind. And I've actually, in the last couple of days, been looking at vacancy rates. Austin, Texas is um, a place that has grown very fast, a big tech boom. It's been a destination for a lot of tech companies and a lot of employment. Their vacancy rates went from 9% about a decade ago to 2.5%. I have never seen in my studies a city that has um, gotten tight that quickly. And yeah. if you follow the news in Austin, what you hear is people saying, I can't believe all the homelessness. And it's like, well, you know what? This is a logical outcome to this housing crisis that you have. And so I've been in all sorts of cities from Charlotte to Raleigh to Louisville to um, Dallas to Phoenix. And these communities are all starting to tighten because the population is moving to the Sun Belt. And I'm deeply concerned if they don't continue to build housing that we're going to start to see more uh, housing precarity and homelessness in those communities. They certainly have some now, but it's nowhere near what our coasts are. And so I have been going to those communities saying, please, 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 you've got to think about housing um, before it's too late. Because once you get into the situation of Seattle and San Francisco, it is much, much, much harder to get out. You know, we're behind the eight ball right now, unfortunately. So um, that's not a terribly optimistic response to your question, but that's that's kind of the lay of the land as I see it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's the end of my questions. I want to thank you for spending time with us and answering these questions and helping us learn a little bit more about what's happening um, in our community and some of that response uh, and thinking about root causes. So thank you. Um, if you have questions for Greg or me, you can enter those into that Q&A tab that was at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'm going to see if there's any questions that the audience had. Katrina, can you help us read our first question? Hi, Dominique. Yes, uh, we have a lot of questions that have come in. So we'll just get going, um, try to kind of condense some of them that seem pretty similar and see how many we're able to get through. Uh, the first couple have to do um, with essentially sharing, even if there is enough housing, how can everyone afford it? So is it just about the supply um, or also the supply at a certain price level? For example, developers can continue creating expensive apartments, but not sure how luxury supply alleviates the homelessness issue. Uh, yes, uh, great question. You're absolutely right. Supply, only supply will not end this. Uh, and so uh, do we need more market rate development in Seattle? We absolutely do because we have a shortage of housing. Will market rate development on its own end homelessness? No chance. And so, um, you know, in my, in, when I do presentations and in the book, we make a very clear argument that what we need is all the above. And um, only building some affordable housing without building the market rate won't be enough because that pressure will continue to move down. Only building market rate and not building affordable will also not deal with people who can't afford housing. And so what I always say is the answer is D, all the above. As someone who gives tests, it's always D. We need market rate housing. We need um, workforce housing, we need housing that's uh, affordable for people with very low incomes. And when we think about the public response to that, the government can be involved in each of those levels in different ways. With market rate housing, it is literally just making sure that we have the zoning, the permitting processes, et cetera, that allow for denser, more production of housing. That doesn't cost any money. It's just a, it's a, stroke, a strike of the pen. Once we start to get into thinking about housing that's affordable, there will need to be subsidy. And that subsidy can come from the federal, state, or local government either through production subsidies, making it more affordable to build housing such that you can charge lower rents, or it's subsidies to individual households, which allow for a household with lower income to access market rate uh, rents. Um, we need all of that, and we desperately need all of that. And, and so when we think about the allocation of public dollars, I am always a, in the camp of let's make sure that we're allocating those dollars towards households uh, of greatest need and, and providing housing that is uh, affordable. And so the, the question, the people asking those questions are exactly right, that this is, there's not a silver bullet here of just building luxury apartments and then we can all go about our business. It's not the case. Do we need those? We sure do, because if we don't build those, everyone's gonna keep going down and, and, and grabbing that housing that's more affordable. And so we have to have a portfolio of housing options and continue to invest it at all levels. Great, thank you so much, Greg. So um, next question, which of course, a lot of these have to do with housing supply, um, but this is um, wondering if there is a relationship that you've seen between uh, the less supply of housing, but more services available in affluent communities. 
um, more supply of housing and could you just Sorry, so I think so uh, less um, availability of affordable housing, but potentially more um, services. Um, so you're saying, have I seen places with lots of services, but not much housing? Um, in I think so. I think, yes, that, yeah. I think that's the question. Um, I would say that the service provision, especially in the homelessness response system, tends to be concentrated in the urban core. It's not exclusively there, but Mary's Place is, is downtown. And so a lot of um, a lot of service provision does happen uh, in the urban core, um, and so um, the house and and so if you have, so I guess I haven't seen a place like let's just think about Bellevue for example is that's a place without a lot of affordable housing, um, also not a robust service system there. It's probably increasing now more than it was ten years ago, but generally speaking, I, I don't see a lot of affluent suburban communities. Um, with expensive housing with lots of services because ultimately there's not a place for people to live. It's also incredibly hard to cite homeless shelters and, and homeless housing in those communities because they're very powerful. Single family homeowners show up and say, you're not building it here. And to date, they've generally been pretty successful in frustrating efforts to cite um, low-income housing in those communities. And so for a variety of reasons, I, I haven't seen a lot of that. Thank you. Um... From what you have found, how has uh, racial restrictive covenants, urban renewal, redlining, and other racially motivated policies and planning impacted homelessness in cities like Seattle? Um, you know, I, I teach a class called Advanced Housing Studies at, at UW, and I what I say to my students is, is that if you want to understand racial disparities in the United States, there are many lenses through which you can think about that. Housing is probably one of the best to really understand that. And the reason for that is all those items that the question answer just list, just listed. And so let's just start with a with um, with a kind of fact about the current composition of the homeless population, and then let's talk about what led to that. So black, brown, indigenous people are three to four times overrepresented in the population of people experiencing homelessness. That's true in a relatively white community like Seattle. It's true in a relatively more diverse community like Chicago. The overrepresentation is very similar, even though the Black population in Chicago is much higher than it is in Seattle. And so what we observe then is, is, it is um, people of color are overrepresented in the population of people experiencing homelessness. Why is that? Why is that? And so what we can trace through multiple systems in society, the housing system, who has had access to mortgage finance over history? It's been white people in certain neighborhoods. What is the major source of wealth creation in the United States? It's through home equity. If you have been discriminated against in mortgage finance and not been able to buy a house in a, in a neighborhood that's appreciating, generation after generation after generation, you're missing out on massive wealth creation. And so when you look at the black white wealth disparity in the United States, it can largely be attributed to home equity. And so when we start to think about and then layering on other disparities in society, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's employment and discrimination in any of those systems, and you put those together generation after generation after generation, that helps to explain why we see this disproportionality. It's not because black people earn less than white people, they do, but that's not the reason why they're overrepresented in the homeless population. And, and so you put all those systems together and then the other real big one is, is the criminal justice system. When you think about the percentage of black men who are incarcerated in their, in their lifetime, it is astronomically high. And if you try to find housing with a criminal background in Seattle, it's incredibly difficult. And so when you layer all these things together, you end up with this huge racial disparity and homelessness. And, and the, that legacy, that housing history uh, plays a really, really important role in understanding this generational um, um, disparity that is, is, is so abundantly clear, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a, a kind of a timeline question. So wondering, is homelessness in the major cities listed, uh, the ones that you shared, greater by percentage now than it was 30 or 20 years ago? Um, the data on homelessness is a little tricky because as a, as, a, as a government, we didn't really start counting until 2007. There were estimates um, before that, and we write about that in the book, but the formal census that we take on an annual basis didn't start until 2007. And it took a few years for um, those that that process to be improved. It's still far from perfect, um, and so we don't have great great data 
going back 30 years. What has happened, let's just say in the last 15 years, is homelessness actually in the last 10 years has actually fallen a little bit across the United States in total. But what's happened is become increasingly prevalent in our coastal cities. So what we argue in the book is that it um, overall levels have gone down, but the variance has gone up, meaning it's much bigger on the coast and it's fallen elsewhere where housing is, is more abundant. And so the problem is just getting much, much worse in a few communities, but actually overall it's been, uh, it's improved a little bit, but it's still at a frustratingly stubbornly high level that has continued to persist over the last uh, two decades. Thank you. And for this one, um... can, can I just follow oh, up on that? I, there's one other point that I wanted to add, which is the, the headline number that we that we list, which is about 582,000 people, is based on a point in time count, which is one night or two nights in January when we count. We all know that that is a gross underestimation of the overall population um, for a couple of reasons. One is it's one night. And so we aren't catching everyone. There's probably more people, especially where unsheltered homelessness is high. It's, it's hard to find people. And so for that reason, it's an undercount. What it's also not capturing is the fact that homelessness, people cycle in and out of homelessness. And so when you think about the number of people within a year who experience homelessness versus people on one night, the number is much, much higher. And when you use education data from the federal government, what we see is there are a million and a half to two million kids who are considered homeless or highly mobile. And that's compared to an overall population of 582,000, according to the point in time count. So this is really a situation of affecting millions of people, let's say three, four, five million people, as opposed to 500,000, if we think about it over a year. Um, and using uh, more uh, robust methods to, to think about this. So this, uh, this is a major, major uh, phenomenon and crisis in the United States. Thank you for sharing and then for providing um, more context with that. Um, what are your thoughts on rent control and the economic impact in a city um, in regards to homelessness? Um, rent control is um, probably one of the more difficult topics in the housing space to, um, to wrestle with. And the reason for that is, um, one, old, a lot of models of rent control haven't worked very well. So my, my, I, I lived in New York City right out of undergrad. Rent control was a big deal there, and it just was a system of winners and losers. If you were lucky enough to get a rent control department, you paid 200 and if you didn't, you paid $1,000. Um, and it had no rhyme or reason with need. Um, it was just if you were lucky enough to have an aunt who had a rent control department or something like that. Um, so when we go to the more modern manifestations of, of rent control, I think there's a lot of merit to the idea of limiting the growth of, of rent from year to year. And we've seen some jurisdictions like Minneapolis, like the state of Oregon do that, which I would call them kind of anti-gouging um, uh, regulations in the sense that you can't exceed five, six, seven percent per year in rent. That doesn't mean that your rent won't be expensive. It just means someone can't gouge you from year to year. More restrictive rent control, like the one that St. Paul, Minnesota um, recently passed, which was, I think, about a 2% cap, is interesting and very exciting from an affordability standpoint. The challenge is, is that developers went bananas, and they were really, really frustrated by that, and it in fact, stopped building. And so what's interesting is... Um, uh, I see merits on both sides of this argument. And, and to me, what it comes down to is what are the benefits from affordability of rent control with the cost of potentially reduced supply? And I think that's an open question and people are debating both sides of that. And so I don't have a firm, I can't tell you I'm pro or against. What I am very sensitive to in places where we don't have enough housing, I don't want um, provisions in place that will frustrate efforts to build more housing, which is why if I were king for a day, Rather than focusing on rent control, I would focus on much more public investment in housing that's affordable. Rather than trying to put a, the market in a, in a headlock and forcing the market to do something else, I would just say there's a role for the public here to construct housing that's affordable, which many nations around the world do. Many nations. Many nations in Europe, 30% of their housing stock is publicly owned and still a thriving housing system. And so rather than trying to take our 96% of housing units that are private and, and, and forcing them into a certain price um, threshold, I would much rather just say, let's figure out what people can afford and let's build that housing and, and have that be a public service. We haven't chosen to do that. And so as a result, now we're caught in this, how do we then regulate the market? And that is easier said, said than done. But there are a lot of people that I really respect that are very, very pro um, rent control. Um, and I also have some people I respect who think it's a terrible, terrible idea. So it's, it's a tough one. 
Thank you so much. So, um, you know, we've heard other kind of temporary measures and solutions that I think across the country and especially in Seattle and King County, we've seen. Um, what is your opinion on um, temporary measures such as tiny homes, tiny villages, things like that? Do you um, feel that those are good solutions to as part of the crisis response? Um, I I will say um, I am not a huge fan of of tiny homes as a response to homelessness. That doesn't mean that I don't think there is a role for them. The reason why I'm not a huge fan is because they are, by definition, um, temporary in nature. Many of them don't have plumbing, um, which is, by definition, that means it's not permanent housing. And one of my frustrations with the push for for tiny homes is I will say then, well, what do we do in three years? when people are still living here? What are we doing in five years or 10 years? Because the reality is there's not a place for people to go. And so if they have a, you know, if they have temporary housing that's working for them, they're, they're not gonna leave. Um, and so to what end? And, and if ultimately this is gonna be a three or five or 10 year solution, it starts to not look very temporary in nature. And then we can start to ask the question of if we had a vacant lot and we put 50 tiny homes all at one story, and we did that for 10 years, what could we have done if we'd gone up and built a 10 story building and, and built permanent units on that space? And so my fear is that, is that the highest and best use for that particular scarce parcel of land where we could have built permanent housing um, that will be here for 50 years at, at much higher numbers than the number of, of sheds that we could put on a particular parcel? I understand um, the desire to get people off the streets into temporary uh, accommodation. And so I, I am not anti if that's part of an overall strategy that the community uh, pursues. I'm, I absolutely support that. But what I want to be clear about is that is one element of the strategy with um, further investments in permanent housing such that that's not the be all and end all. I think it's a bridge to nowhere if ultimately we think that that's going to end homelessness because it's not. It's going to put people in these little sheds for extended periods of time. I would say in other communities where land is less scarce, where land is more abundant, where putting up sheds in, in vacant land that, that is available is a much better, much better idea than in a place like Seattle where we have to take advantage of every single parcel we have. And we have to think about the highest and best use for that. And I would argue that over a 10, 15 year period, uh, tiny homes is probably not the highest and best use for, for these scarce parcels. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts but on again, that. But again, people I respect disagree with me on this, right? This is one where, where well-intentioned people come out on both sides. And so I, I respect um, folks who disagree with me on this one. So kind of in a, a, the same realm of, of course, you know, opportunities to create more affordable housing. Um, do you think that there may be a trend for more dense, low-income housing arising specifically in Seattle? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, whether that manifests itself is, is one of local politics, and local housing politics is really, really difficult. Um, you know, Seattle zone 75% single family. And we know, uh, and it's not just in Seattle, it's all around the country. When we go to change that, people get irritated and frustrated. And people show up at planning meetings saying, I don't want apartments in my neighborhood. I don't want, quote, those people in my neighborhood. I don't want my character, my neighborhood to be disrupted. What about the traffic? Where are people going to park? What about the schools are overcrowded? We hear this over and over and over and over. And so transitioning from a disproportionately single family zoned city to a denser city that will allow for more dense, more affordable housing is one necessary, two, it will happen. And it's going to be difficult to go from A to B. There's going to be a lot of heartache in that process, but it's going to happen because it has to. We have to have more housing in Seattle to accommodate all the people who want to live here over the next 50 years. So we'll get denser. It's just going to be a somewhat painful process as we as we make that transition from the land use of the 1970s in Seattle to the land use that we desperately need now, which is for a booming global tech city, which is what we are, like it or not. Thank you, Greg. So just have a couple more questions here. Um, so want to thank everyone for all the incredible questions coming in. So if we can't get to yours, um, we can be sure to follow up. Um, but for a couple more questions, um, in your opinion, who would you say should kind of quote unquote own the homelessness challenge and initiatives within King County? Um, what government body or group can and should be coordinating across other stakeholder stakeholders to really drive change? Uh, that is a super good question, a very astute question, and one that's hard to answer. Um, 
how do I want to answer that? I'll take one step back um, at a higher level and then get back to the specific question, which is, to a certain extent, the federal government, which has by far the deep, deepest pockets in the United States, has pushed these issues down on, on state and local governments because we have not funded low-income housing at a federal level at anywhere near, this, near the scale of need. So one in five people who are eligible for housing support from the federal government get it. Five out of five, or everyone who's eligible for food support gets it. If you're eligible for food stamps, which is now called SNAP, you get it. Housing, you go into a lottery. And four of the five people don't win the lottery, and therefore they come to the state of Washington, they come to King County, they come to the city of Seattle saying, I need help with housing. And that's a big burden on local and state governments because housing is so darn expensive. And so who has to own this? I would argue the federal government should be owning a lot more of this than they do. And the homelessness crisis has, um, you know, the federal government deserves a lot of blame for this. Now, that being said, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So then it does come down to the question, which the question asker appropriately poses, which is then who's responsible? Is it, is it the state government? Is it Dow Constantine? Is it Mayor Harrell? Is it the regional homelessness authority? Is it some combination thereof? And that's a very, very difficult question. I do believe in the fundamental logic behind the regional homelessness authority. And the reason for that is housing and homelessness is a regional issue. And when you have jurisdictions battling county versus city, that is, in my opinion, counterproductive, which is why the logic, I think, is sound. Actually doing it is really, really hard. As we've seen, it is difficult to get all these different jurisdictions together and come up with a cohesive plan because ultimately each of those jurisdictions have voters who are irritated and who vote and tell city council members and local mayors saying, you do this or we're going to vote you out. And so this local politics makes this, these regional um, efforts and regional coordination uh, difficult. And if you're the county exec, if you're the mayor of Seattle, completely ceding all responsibility to another entity that you don't have control of, even though it's a lot of your money, is a scary prospect. So I understand there's a need to maintain some control. And so this is a long-winded non-answer to your question, which is, it's really, really hard. But I do believe firmly that a regional approach is necessary, but figuring out the governance and the control and the allocation of resources in that is, is, is really difficult. But I continue to support the, the authority because I do think it's a better approach than the fragmented each jurisdiction saying, well, this is Seattle's problem, I don't have to worry about it. Because that is, in my opinion, not a sustainable approach to um, uh, fixing this problem. The other thing that I would say is the Regional Homelessness Authority can't change the housing stock in our region. They don't have the budget and they don't have the resources to do that. And so if we fundamentally believe that homelessness is because of a lack of affordable housing, and we're saying the Regional Homeless Authority is responsible for ending homelessness, but they can't build affordable housing, that's a disconnect. That's a disconnect. And so what we need to think about is not only the homeless response system, but how does that layer into our regional strategy around production and provision of affordable housing, because those need to be arm in arm. And right now they, they aren't. And so to a certain extent, we're asking the impossible of the Regional Homeless Authority to say end homelessness, but you can't build any, provide housing for people or at scale that we need. How's that for dodging a question? <laughs> it's, it's not dodging. It's <laughs> trying to share information about a really complicated, complex issue, right? Um, we. Know, what do you think, um, Dami? I'm curious for your answer to that question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I, it's, it's, it's a really hard one. Um, I would like for Katrina to repeat it because I was listening to you in all these different ways, and so. Katrina, will you repeat the question? I'll give a little bit. We're getting close to the close. I do want to say that this is the last question. And if there's other questions that have come in, we will be responding to you all via email. Um, but Katrina, if you could share that one more time and then um, we can yes. close out. And thank you. Definitely. <laughs> so essentially, um, just wondering who, who do you feel quote unquote owns um, the response to homelessness in our community, whether it comes to, you know, government, different groups, what level that that kind of a, um, thought. Yeah. Um, as you were going through all of these different folks, right, I fundamentally do believe that it is a community issue. And so everyone must play a part to be a part of the solution. And so um, I love working side by side with the folks every day doing the work. 
Um, I also think that folks in our community that give their time or resources, those are really pivotal, but then there's also the other pieces, right? We do have this regional approach. Um, while it may be difficult in trying to figure out all of the kinks, um, when you think about that fundamentally being the approach to help us solve this crisis, um, we are putting our faith in that, right? We're contributing to that strategic plan that was created and families are called out very specifically and um, as well as the other populations, right? Our youth and young adults, our um, single adults, our um, elders, right? So all of those uh, different complexities and those with disabilities. And so I think about that when you can really think about what is the problem we're trying to solve for and what resources and people and in those powerful positions, right? That we know like help us make those decisions. But I think that we are all a part of the solution um, and we all have to um, keep elevating voices. And I also think that the people experiencing um, homelessness also need to have a seat at the table because they can tell you what they need and they are the experts. And so we have to be listening as well. So that's my answer. Um, but I totally agree with a lot of what you said too, uh, Greg. So thank you so much. We are at our time. Um, and so I just want to thank you again for sharing your thoughtful research and insight with us today. And thank you all of you um, for joining us on our webinar for this conversation. We hope you found this um, insightful and helpful to better understand all of the complexities around homelessness and um, the issues that we're facing here in King County. If you have additional questions, we'd love for someone from our team to be able to respond to you. Um, Katrina is going to place an email um, in the chat that you can reach out to, so please do that. If you'd like to learn more about Greg's book, um, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, visit the website at homelessnessisahousingproblem.com. Katrina is also putting that in the chat. And there are other ways that you can help support Mary's Place. Um, and to ensure that no child sleeps outside in our community. You can check out our website at marysplaceseattle.org for more information about donating, volunteering, and our upcoming events, um, which will also be a link in the chat. Um, we are gonna be doing more lunch and learns and um, learning more aspects about the work we do um, together with our partners to address this issue around preventing family homelessness, and we hope to see you all in the future at those. You will see a survey that is gonna pop up in your browser right after you exit this Lunch and Learn. And we hope you can take a few minutes to answer those questions and so we can learn and think about other discussions for our future and what could be helpful. So please feel free to share other topics and other learnings that you're interested in. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today.